Good to see everyone. So it's about 10 o'clock, so we're glad that you're all here. Are you all getting a little feedback or is it just that I'm getting it in my ear? Yeah, getting a little. Yeah, exactly. They're getting a little feedback, Luke. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Is it better now? That's probably better now, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, I guess we'll have to tag team. Okay. All right. It's always nice to have a continual learning curve. Um, so we're live on Facebook <laughs> and uh, really glad to see everyone. I guess I'll, I'll just mute everyone and then you're welcome to unmute uh, when it's time to share or pray or things like that. Roxanne's gonna be our worship leader. I'll just say a couple things of tech, tech side things and then invite uh, Roxanne to do our, our actual welcome. Just that we're live on Facebook and, uh, and then the meeting is being recorded on Zoom so it'll be available for people later. So just keep that in mind as you consider what you're gonna share. Uh, really nice to see everyone. Glad we can gather this way and um, Glad to be part of the body of Christ together. Uh, as, we, as we usually do week by week, we'll just take a moment to remember the original inhabitants of the land, the Abenaki people. Um, and we remember that many of the Abenaki folks are still among us in our communities. So we take just a moment to recollect um, their being the first inhabitants of this land. And perhaps as we think of a few things that we're grateful for about the land where we reside, uh, we can remember our connectedness to all the people, um, animals, plants, everything about the, about the environment where we live with, with gratitude and an awareness of our being stewards of this place. So I'll uh, invite us to continue our worship as we listen to our prelude. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone who is uh, either here as a long-term member or if you're new, it's always a pleasure. Um, I wanted to talk about something that I've been 
thinking about a lot the last couple of weeks. And at work, my boss and I have a, a monthly meeting. And so, you know, you talk about boring stuff, which some of my job is very boring, um, such as project work, you know, system things, things like that. But then she always asks me a question it's like, you know, how are you doing? But this past time, she asked me a question that I've thought about every day since. And she said, how are you filling up your bucket? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, your bucket, you know, you, you give, you have this bucket and you give of yourself, your talent, your energy, you know, whatever it is. She goes, but how are you filling your bucket? And I'm like, I've never thought of it like that before. And so every day I've been thinking of it. And I, when I got up this morning, I was thinking, you know, how do I fill up my bucket? Well, yesterday I filled up my bucket with my bestie, Kathy Jameson, on a walk and a giggle and, and, and having a moment of joy, right? I fill up my bucket with my grandson and my, and my children. And then I realized that one way that I fill up my bucket, which is so important, is that I come into this worship area, whether it's on Zoom or we come into our wonderful church and I see all of you, and I worship with you, and I also feel that God helps fill my bucket, and that to me is a wonderful way. So today I, I encourage you and say, how are you filling your bucket up? And something to think about. So with that being said, let us join in our, um, our words uh, of worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. You might want day to, to day, Catherine. Or, oh, it was Catherine doing it? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Unmute, Catherine. <laughs> <It's> unmuted. <laughs> we'll start over. All right. The heavens day. are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. More desirable are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Thanks be to God. Please join in the first hymn, um, I Come With Joy. <laughs> Such friendship, man. 
So our life with God encompasses everything that we do in life. Our hopes, our fears, our joys, our sorrows, our intentions, our omissions are all really holy. They're part of our spiritual life. So may we today come before God in prayer, being fully open, fully honest, that we might be fully healed also. Let us join together in our prayer of confession, and I will um, put this in the chat window too if people want to pick it up there. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Diane, would you be willing to lead us in the um, sharing of the peace of Christ? Certainly. So Christ, peace be with you. Amen. So last week's sermon stemmed from the story of the wedding at Cana. It was an early event. And if you remember the the wording of it, it was the, um, said it was like the first of the signs of Jesus in John's gospel. So this week, we are sort of jumping tracks from John's gospel over to Luke's gospel. And the train's sort of going in the same direction, but a different story of a beginning of Jesus' ministry. So here on this track, like in Luke's gospel, we heard two weeks ago about the story of Jesus' baptism. And we're sort of like moving ahead now to what's considered the beginning of Jesus' public ministry is the way it gets talked about. So here's the scripture passage. It comes to us from Luke in the fourth chapter. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee And a report about him spread throughout the surrounding countryside, and he began to teach in their synagogues, and he was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he he unrolled the scroll And he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled the scroll up, gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
This is the word of God. May it be for us the word of life. Rob Bell gave a, a talk some years ago. It was entitled Dust, which he began by speaking of Jesus, having grown up in the region called the Galilee. Jesus, who was Jewish and part of the people who believed that God had spoken to Moses and had given Moses the Torah. Torah meaning like the teachings or the instruction or the way. The Torah, Bell goes on to say, was the center of the focus of their educational system. Most of the boys and girls around age six would be taught Torah. They'd go to a synagogue and they'd be instructed by a local rabbi. This was called Bet Sefer, and it lasted until they were about 10 years old. The learning really was about memorization. And by the age of 10, these children would have the Torah memorized. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. By the end of Bet Sefer, most of the young people weren't going to school anymore. They were beginning to learn a trade, learning how to manage a family household. But those with a certain calling, they would continue on in their learning. They entered what's called Bet Talmud. The ones with the most natural ability would then memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, starting with Genesis and memorizing all the way to Malachi. By the end of that, around age 15, they had it all down, all the scriptures. You know, they had it like here in their mind and they had it here in their hearts. Not too many people would continue past Bet Talmud, but those who did, those who continued on further, they studied Bet Midrash. And what they would do is they would apply to a rabbi to be one of the rabbi's disciples. A disciple doesn't just want to like know what the rabbi knows, but they want to be like the rabbi is, and they want to do what the rabbi does. And rabbis differed in how they followed the Torah. They had these different sets of interpretations. So each rabbi's teaching, each of their interpretations, that was called the rabbi's yoke. So if a follower wanted to learn from a rabbi, they wanted to take the yoke of the rabbi upon them. Again, to know and to be and to do like the rabbi. Now, Jesus' own period of Bet Sefer and Bet Talmud and Bet Midrash, we do not know the specifics of. Or which rabbi or which rabbis taught him, whose yoke he took upon himself. But he did learn the scriptures and the teachings, which didn't just come sort of like preloaded or pre-programmed into Jesus' own being. Jesus learned, and he knew the letter of the law, and he also, we know from the stories, he sensed the spirit of the Torah to take like all of these pages from Genesis to Malachi and distill them, getting the essence, which I suspect is what Jesus is doing here walking into the synagogue, which for him apparently was a sort of homecoming. It had become home for him. The smells of the stone, the dust, the space, even the people who gathered there, who could join in person for services, grown-ups and youth and children, all of whom had the synagogue as their weekly, if not daily routine. And coming home, this Jesus filled with the spirit, Jesus stands up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Not that he had to read that part of the scroll because he had it all inside of him. Yet he turned anyway to this passage. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I 
have this feeling that it's not by accident that Jesus read this passage. It's not by accident that he spoke about anointing. It's not by accident that he recited good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, the oppressed going free. Instead, Jesus is on purpose setting a stage here, making a few brief inaugural address remarks about his plan, his vision. You know, if, if not for his years in office, then for his years by the lakeshore or along the byways or in the fields or on the mounts, his plans for being with the people who are known and the people who were unknown, for being with the people on the inside and the people on the outside, his plans for the whole and the broken hearted. This is going to be Jesus' work. That's why he reads it from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. As he says, as he's being inaugurated, he shouts out, good news, release, sight, and freedom. And perhaps Jesus wasn't so much born to die, according to this address. Instead, he was born that people might live especially those whose lives are most at risk, proclaiming a justice that has echoed down through the generations, resonating in souls like Desmond Tutu, whose life we've been celebrating, who once said, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality he said, I'm sure, with a smile. A mouse or a man trapped. Jesus says, let all the oppressed go free. And oh, that at his inauguration, Jesus had had an inaugural poet by his side, the likes of Amanda Gorman, who about a year ago took the yoke in speaking and embodying these words. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine tree and fig, that no one shall make them afraid. If we are to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade. The hill we climb, if only we dare. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we feel it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it, Miss Gorman proclaimed. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but as those in the synagogue heard the reading. Right then, it was fulfilled today. Echoes we might hear in the teachings of the Zen master, advocate for peace, Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away yesterday at the age of 95. Yesterday is already gone, Tai said. Tomorrow is not yet here. Today is the only day available to us. It is the most important day of our lives. Today. It's also the title of a contemporary reading that we'll hear now. It's written by Debbie Thomas and read by Roxanne Cassidone. So Roxanne, um, hit it. If your pastor told you to feast, celebrate, and rejoice right now, because today is a day holy to the Lord, how would you respond? If one of your spiritual mentors insisted that this year, 2022, is the year of the Lord's favor, what would you say? <laughs> I'd be honest. I would say, you've got to be kidding me. This year, this one, today, right now, how can that possibly be? I don't think I'd be alone in my skepticism. And as I type these words, 
Omicron is overwhelming the planet. Hospitals are reaching capacity. Physicians and nurses are exhausted. National and local economies are flailing. And COVID's death toll continues to rise. And this is before we mention any of the other challenges facing us. Wars and threats of wars. Violence of all stripes the catastrophic effects of climate change, the long shadow of racial injustice, alarming breakdowns in civility and basic kindness, rising epidemics of anxiety, depression, addiction, and despair. Who on earth would reasonably call our current moment holy or favored of God? Now, I realize how reluctant I am at times to embrace the holiness of today. Perhaps like some of you, I have spent the last two years living on hold, deferring and deflecting as if the days we live in right now don't count as real life. Real life will resume after the pandemic, I tell myself. Real life will resume when church services go back to being in person when we can celebrate the Eucharist with bread and wine, when we put away our masks for good, when we get some sort of handle on climate change, police brutality, teen depression, and sectarian violence. I wonder if I do this because I am full of pent-up grief, longing, regret, and lament that have nowhere to go. Maybe I assume that I can't lean into God's joy until all my sorrows are spent or that worship can only be at art an articulation of happiness, not grief or anger or confusion or doubt. And if so, can I remind myself that God's embrace is wide enough to hold all of human experience? Can I trust that divine abundance is possible now? even in the midst of uncertainty and pain? Can I say amen to God's word in the complicated circumstances that I live in today, right now? Perhaps the now of God means we have to stand up, shake the dust off, and move. What if the release of the captives and the healing of the blind require that we step out of our prison cells and open our eyes? It's one thing to scan the horizon of someday for the year of the Lord's favor. It's quite another to live boldly into that favor now. So I'll invite us to hear Jesus' words of a prophecy's fulfillment in his today and for our own today as well. A day when we need perhaps more than ever good news proclaimed to all of us, all of those who live in a land of darkness. And may our hearing and our doing of this good word become our own inaugural statement or mission statement of faith. For today is our only day, the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.
But this time, uh, if people would, if you'd like to unmute, you're welcome to and share prayers that you might bring today. Uh, just sort of anything that might be on your heart or mind. I'll remind folks that we're we're still on Facebook Live, so just be mindful of that as you choose what you might want to share in terms of the public nature of it. And if there are other things you'd like to mention as prayers after uh, we're done with our public part of our service, people can mention that as well. Um, what do people bring as prayers this morning? So, Roxanne? Carl, just a, just a, from our, our uh, typical, when we pray for someone and for a church family, today we, we uh, celebrated and say prayers for the Edgerly Walsh family, Jessica, Ben, Ruby, and Gabriel. And then for the prayer for the church family, it is us this week. So let us pray for each other. And for Carl. <laughs> Thank you. May all God's people say amen. Glad to have, uh, have everyone gathered together today. Yeah, prayer requests for nephew Russell Tremblay and family to recover from injury. And I um, thought somebody else was going to ask for a prayer request. Is there another hand up? Oh, is it Diane? Yeah, so uh, just prayers of joy and thanksgiving for Dakota Whitaker's installation and ordination later today. Um, and then just continued prayers, my staff member, Heather, who um, had some medical tests done before she realized she was pregnant. Um, they've found a cyst on the baby's brain, but they think it's fairly typical. It's just that technology now picks up on it, but she is going in for a further consult tomorrow. So just prayers for her and her, her little baby boy that's still developing. Mercy, hear our prayers. I did wonder, uh, just, yeah, and Diane's preaching at Dakota Whitaker's installation a little bit later on this afternoon at three o'clock. Uh, that will be on Facebook Live. So if anybody has access to that and wants to see it, you could. I think we'll be able to share a link to it uh, later also. It'll be recorded. Um, I did wonder if we had um, three people, one person that could write the word happy on a sign during our service, uh, one person who could write, um, ordination and a third person who could write Dakota, D-O-K-A-T-A. -A. We could take a picture at the end and uh, those three people, like Diane, if you would do happy and um, Kathy Jamison, do you have paper around? Could you do confirmation? And um, somebody else have paper not too far away and could do the name Dakota? Did, you, you... did you mean confirmation? I meant ordination. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hopefully I hope you didn't already write. <laughs> yeah. Happy ordination, Dakota. And then I can sort of like put you all together on my screen and we can take a little picture we could send to him. So Catherine, if you would do Dakota. Okay, and we'll just do it maybe at the end of the service before everyone jumps off, we can uh, surround him with our, our thoughts and our prayers. Um, what other, any other prayers that people are thinking about you'd like to mention this morning? I'll mention some prayer concerns that have been uh, more public. Catherine Vaughn has been in the hospital, is still in the hospital with COVID and pneumonia. She is doing better, but has been in for a few days and um, her family is okay with people knowing about that. Um, and I was just recognizing this week that Vermont passed the 500th death from COVID mark. So uh, certainly we hold um, all those who have lost loved ones in our hearts and grieve with them and also gratitude for so many people in the healthcare community. And Janet Furmeister had asked for prayers for a baby, uh, Madison Grace, who was born, um, had some complications uh, just prior to, to her birth, but is doing, is doing well now. Uh, Jim, and then I'll go to Catherine. Yeah, just continued prayers for my stepsister, Nancy, who's, um, uh, stop chemotherapy and is, you know, deteriorating a bit um, this week, I've heard. So um, she's probably um, towards the last weeks of her life. So with her and her family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Catherine? Sorry. Um, just for our president and our Congress, um, that, that truly we you know, we claim to be Christian, that we could listen to today's uh, 
words from Jesus and put them into practice in our nation. Lord, in your mercy, uh, hear our prayers. Okay, then I will, I'll invite us to join together in prayer. Oh God, by your spirit, you settled upon Jesus and, and inspired and, and moved through him over the course of his life, beginning with this ministry moment at the synagogue in Nazareth. We would ask, oh God, that that same spirit that settles upon him would be with us, within us, moving through us as well. You know the places of need and the places of wonderful joy. You know the places of fear that reside in our hearts and the hearts of others. And you know the pathway to freedom. You know the complications of those who are imprisoned, either incarcerated, facing a myriad challenge through their incarceration, or those who have been victims of those who are incarcerated and perhaps find themselves trapped in their own hurt. So we ask, oh God, that by your spirit, you might be about the work of illuminating the key that can unlock the door that we might be set free to be your people, Lord, by your grace. We ask that you would be near to all of those who are brokenhearted in these days and all those who need healing which is each of us in our own ways, of course. And we ask, oh God, that you would especially be with leaders because they both cast visions and oftentimes have the power to implement things for bad or for good, but be with leaders in our land in these days that they might work for a peaceful community. We give thanks for people like Thich Nhat Han, who just passed away yesterday, for Desmond Tutu, whose life we've been celebrating, and for all of those who have been beacons of light and hope in our world. May we sweep up the inspiration that comes from them and live out their love and their peace, their compassion and their joy in our own lives. For all the unspoken prayers, O oh God, we also pray and ask that you would be with us, binding us as one people, even as we tie our voices together as one now in praying the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
At this time, if people have announcements about things that are happening in the life of the church, you're welcome to share those. Maybe it's by committee or um, some other update people want to give. Maybe one of the deacons could give a little update on your um, food preparation yesterday. Sylvia, would you be willing to do that? Sure. Yes, I want to thank all the deacons for joining me down at the church yesterday when we made a nice meal of uh, shepherd's pie for the Good Samaritan Haven. We always have fun doing it. It's such a, it's also a good time for fellowship since we don't get to get together much together anymore. So uh, it was really fun and they were much appreciative. Um, and just so that the um, congregation can know, we've also donated paper products to to the Good Samaritan Haven, which they were very grateful for. And we're gonna be dropping them off this week to the circle and also capstone. So um, we're trying to continue our work and we appreciate all the help that the congregation does in their donations and so forth, um, because we are using part of the, the money that they donate to the food pantry at the, at the church to pay for these meals and stuff. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you so much. Other announcements people would like to make, Diane? Uh, yes, just for the nominating committee to know that we have um, filled all of the spots and, um, you know, there's a little bit of work for the auditor, but um, we are set and I will be sending out that list. So we are good to go. Did you have okay. something? Yeah, and I'll just add that I don't know that it's been noted that um, Marion Walker has passed away, um, George Walker's sister. Um, so um, I don't know if there's any news about a service or anything, and that's coming in this, uh, better weather. Um, but I didn't see that in the paper. Thank you for highlighting that, Jim. And there, there are uh, preliminary plans for service in the spring, but uh, sort of date to be determined. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, just a reminder, our annual meeting is next Sunday, right? Yes, it is. Yes, hope um, folks can join us. It will unfortunately be a virtual meeting on Zoom uh, following worship, right, Carl? That's right, yep. So we'll be sending out a, a, a meeting packet. It'll go out electronically. And then people who have been receiving the uh, copy of the bulletins, uh, paper printed copies, uh, those will be going out on Monday. So you'll have some, uh, some time to review that before the meeting next week. So yeah, thanks to everybody who's put work into uh, the creation of the report, especially uh, Cindy Hooker and um, all the committees whose work has folded into that report. And so the, what we'll do at the annual meeting is we'll be electing new elders and deacons and auditors and uh, then hearing reports from the committees and approving the one uh, financial piece the congregation will be approving is pastoral compensation. So yeah, uh, we look forward to gathering next week. We'll just have a little break between the worship service and the gathering and, and then have our, our annual meeting. Great. Okay, well then um, we're grateful as always for people's generosity and uh, the church has been very blessed by people's consistency and, and their uh, faithful support. So we're grateful for that in the many ways that it shows up. And um, with that, I'll invite us to sing our closing hymn. Um, we are your people.
So as our benediction, I'll, I'll offer these words from Thich Nhat Hanh. Sometimes your joy is the source of your smile, but sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. If we are peaceful, if we are happy, we can smile and blossom like a flower and everyone in our family, our entire society will benefit from our peace. And lastly, you must love in such a way that the person you love feels free. So in memory of Thich Nhat Hanh and for the love of Jesus Christ, go forth to smile, go forth to live in peace, go forth to love all those that are around you so that they might feel able to see again, able to be again, the very child of God that they are. May it be so now in every moment, every today of your life. Amen. Thank you.